Hello, Alex Sasser here hosting another episode of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. We are so glad you tuned in today and want to make you aware of some great resources available from this ministry. The free Touching Lives app is available on both Apple and Android smartphones and through the Amazon App Store, Roku, and Apple TV. Go to touchinglives.org slash apps to learn more. Next, start your day in the Word of God using the daily devotional email from Touching Lives. You can register right now at touchinglives.org slash devotionals to begin receiving your daily email. And finally, be sure to sign up for Dr. Merritt's monthly Bible teaching letter. This letter is delivered for free in print right to your mailbox each month. Go to our website at touchinglives.org slash letter to register today. Thank you again for joining us. And now here is today's sermon from Dr. James Merritt. I'm always excited when I preach. I am pumped today. I, I really am. So I want you to kind of get ready because it's going to be, I'm telling you, this is such an incredible story. You see, America has a cheating problem. And, and, and I, I'm not talking about your, you know, your high schooler who may or may not cheat his, on his history exam. I'm talking about cheating in marriage. Recent Gallup poll said that 20% of men and 13% of women admitted to cheating on their spouse. But the key word is admitted. Because pollsters say that many people will lie in a survey like that because of what they call social acceptability bias. Here's what that means. Everybody believes, it's almost universal, that infidelity is wrong. That's still one of the things we still believe. That's just not a cool thing to do. So people have this internal, uh, it's kind of a subliminal thinking that even though nobody's going to know who you are, somebody might find out. So the cheaters will lie and deny that they're cheating. And so pollsters say that the real numbers are probably double or even triple what we think they are. And we all know that just behind financial problems, the number two cause of divorce is adultery, or if you suspect your spouse is guilty of adultery. Now, I've been married for 43 years, happily married, and I know that the foundation of marriage is trust. Once a spouse loses trust in the other spouse, whether it's deserved or not, it's going to go sideways every single time. And we also know, and I'm convinced, that trust is not just essential to a marriage. I found that every real, strong, true relationship I have with anybody is built on trust. But trust in its of itself is not enough because trust is built on the foundation of faithfulness. And I'm not just talking about sexual faithfulness. I'm talking about financial faithfulness. I'm talking about emotional faithfulness, faithfulness to tell the truth, faithfulness to hear the truth. The wisest man who ever lived, according to the Bible, a man named Solomon, said this thousands of years ago. He said, many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful person, who can find? And I want to be honest. I think it's harder to answer that question now than it was thousands of years ago. It's hard to find truly faithful people. We're concluding a series I've so enjoyed. I hope you have. We've been calling it Mirror Image. And what we've been saying is, imagine you had a mirror that would show you what you look like, not on the outside, but on the inside. What would you see? What kind of a character would you have? Today we're going to look at a bedrock of character that I think is both a great revealer and a great developer of character, and that is faithfulness. It is, a, it is just one of the rocks, it's one of the bricks that have to go into the foundation. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do something today that it takes a lot for me to do this. Uh, I've been, some of you, I've been your pastor for 30 years. Some of you 25, some 20, some 15, some 10. For a lot of you, I've been your pastor for a long time. I'm finally going to tell you, I have been preaching something for years, and I was just dead wrong. Now, I've totally changed my mind. Matter of fact, I've only been wrong twice in my life. This one I'm about to tell you, the other time I was wrong was when I thought I was, but I wasn't. <laughs> I have said all of my ministry that the greatest ability is availability. I now realize that's wrong. That really, that's not wrong. I mean, that's just not right. The greatest ability anybody can have is not availability. The greatest ability anybody can have is reliability. Because if you're available, but you're not reliable, it'd be better off if you just weren't available. So the greatest ability of all is availability. And today, we're going to look at a man 
who was inducted into God's Hall of Fame for one reason. He was a faithful man. We have a Savior who was born 2,000 years ago who died on a cross and came back from the grave because this man was faithful. There is a nation in existence today, one of the most powerful nations in the world, that history had given up for dead many, many years ago, but it came back to life because of this man's faithfulness. He has been called the father of the faithful. Somebody else has called him the brightest star in the Hebrew heaven because of his faithfulness. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Who am I talking about? Abraham. That's right. I'm talking about Abraham. And there was an incident that took place in his life about 3,000 years ago that gave him an opportunity to both demonstrate and define what true faithfulness really is. So if you brought a copy of God's Word or you want to look on your tablet or phone, we're in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Now before I get into the story, let me kind of set this up, tell you what's going on. The story actually begins 25 years before the story we're about to read. God called Abraham, a man who lived in a land called Ur. God called Abraham to leave the land of Ur and go to a land he had never seen before. And he made Abraham a promise. He said, Abraham, if you'll obey me, if you'll follow me, I'm going to bring out of you a descendant that will absolutely transform the world. I'm absolutely going to bring someone that will just make this world so completely, totally different. And his faithfulness kicks in the very first day of the story. Because when God told Abraham to leave his country and his people and his family, you've got to understand the sacrifice Abraham was making. Back in the day when Abraham was alive, your identity was tied up in two things. The clan that you belonged to and the land that you lived on. Your security depended upon those same things. Because back in that day, there were no police. So the only protection you had against robbery and assault and thievery and violence was your family or your extended family. As a matter of fact, your future prosperity was at stake because they didn't have Social Security or welfare 3,000 years ago. So if you got old, your only hope of being taken care of, do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? Do you have an extended family that will take care of you? So Abraham obeys God. Leaves with the assurance of God's promise that he was going to make from him a great nation and bless him for all eternity. But there was a a little bitty hitch in Abraham's thinking. Because at that time, Abraham and Sarah had been married conservatively for about 50 years. And here's what we read about them. Now, Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. So God is telling Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to give you a child. I'm going to give you a son, and out of your son, I'm going to make a great nation. But Abraham says, look, we've been married 50 years, and we've not had any children. But he trusted God. He knew somehow God's going to keep his promise. Now, what you're about to read, let me just warn you, at first it's going to be very confusing. And it's going to be very hard to believe. Yet, it's what makes the story so confusing and so hard to believe that makes it such an inspiring lesson of what faithfulness really means and why faithfulness is so important to character. So if you want to know, I'm going to give you a test today, okay? This is a faithfulness test. Would you say about yourself, you know, I am reliable. Would you say to yourself, I think God would consider me faithful. Well, let's just put that to the test. Because if you are faithful, number one, you will go where you need to go. If you're faithful, you will go where you need to go. Now, spoiler alert right off the bat. The beginning of the story is going to leave you dazed. It's going to leave you confused. It's going to make some of you even a little bit angry. It's going to to be why some people say, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I don't think we ought to read the Old Testament. I don't think we need the Old Testament. I think we need to cut the Old Testament loose. This is a great example of why I don't even like to read the Old Testament. So we're going to pick it up here in Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, never before and never since had God ever asked for a human sacrifice. That had never happened. 
God had given Abraham and, I, uh, and Sarah what they thought would never happen. God gave them a son. His name is Isaac. Now here is God telling Abraham to take the son that he had promised him, the son that carried his every hope, and sacrifice him. Now, before you jump to any conclusions, before you start going, how in the world could a good God do that? Why in the world would God ask that? Before you do that, there's a key word you need to remember. I'm going to remind you of it over and over. There's a key word that you need to remember in this story that governs the entire story. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to date some of us right now, okay? Between 1963 and 1997, you heard this message more than once. Some of you will remember this. This is a test. This station is conducting a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. How many of you remember that? You're showing your age, okay? Some of you are going, I don't know what you're talking about. So for those of you who don't know, you'd be sitting there watching your favorite ball game or your soap opera you're watching or the news or whatever, and all of a sudden you'd hear this, ah, ah, ah. this is a test. It's only a test, okay? This, this is what I want you to hear. The first sentence of this story is the key to the entire story. God is testing Abraham, okay? Everybody hear that? God is testing Abraham. The Hebrew word for tested literally means to prove the quality of something by putting it through some kind of trial. Now, here's where we're going to get kind of deep a little bit, so hang with me. You need to understand something about you and God, and if you forget this, you're going to go sideways with God. If you forget this, you're going to shake your fist at God. If you get this, you're going to be disappointed in God. If you forget this, you're going to get angry with God. Okay, you ready? You and I are in the trusting business. God is in the testing business. We're in the trusting business. God's in the testing business. And I'm going to tell you, God's a great tester. And by the way, testing can be a really good thing. I mean, you know, some people say, well, I, I don't like to be tested. Will you better? I mean, how, I, listen, how would you like to get on an airplane? And you're flying from here. Let's say you're flying to Los Angeles. And the pilot comes on and says, we have a real treat for you today. This plane's never been tested. You're the first one to fly this plane. <laughs> so I don't think that'd be a cool idea, right? Or how would you like for a doctor to perform surgery on you who never took one test in medical school? In fact, I heard about a, 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 a man that was having surgery. He was in the hospital, sweating bullets. He was shaking like a leaf, and uh, he's about to have surgery. So his doctor walked in, and he said, son, you look kind of nervous. He said, well, I am. He said, what are you nervous about? He said, well, this is my first surgery. The doctor said, well, I, I know how you feel. It's my first surgery. I mean... <laughs> How would you like that? You say, well, no, I, I want that doctor to be tested. Well, the opening line of this story is kind of helping cushion us from the shock of the story that follows. So keep in mind now, this entire story is a what? It's a test, okay? It is a test. Now, question. Wait a minute. Time out. Why does God test us? Why can't God just leave us alone? Why can't he just live and let live? Why does God test us? Great question. Two easy answers. God tests us, number one, testing is an opportunity for God to prove his faithfulness to us. Number two, testing is an opportunity for us to prove our faith in God. So that's why God tests us. He says, look, you know why I'm going to test you? I want to prove to you I'm faithful. But I want you to prove to me and prove to you that you have faith in me. So remember, everybody remember, what business are we in? We're in the trusting business. What business is he in? He's in the testing business, okay? Faith is shown in faithfulness, and faith is grown through faithfulness. God not only gives us faith, he grows our faith, and the way God grows for our faith is by testing our faith. And when God tests you, as I said, he does a great job. Because probably nobody in the Old Testament was ever tested like Abraham. Because the test comes in the form of a command in three words. Here's what he says to Abraham. Abraham, take Isaac. I want you to go, take, and sacrifice as a burnt offering. Now, we don't really know what he just said to, to him. Because we, we didn't live back in that day. Because these words really kind of hide how graphic this is. Because let me tell you what happened in a burnt sacrifice. 
When you offered a burnt sacrifice, number one, you would slit the throat of the animal and bleed him to death. When the animal died, you would cut the animal up into pieces. You would dismember that animal. Then you would offer the various body parts, one part as a time, at a time, as a sacrifice by fire. That is what God is asking Abraham to do. No lethal injection, no quick shot. He's going to suffer. You're going to slit his throat. You're going to dismember him. You're going to put him on the altar. And you're going, man, how strange is it that God would ask Abraham to sacrifice the very son he had given him and promised him. This son that's to be the forerunner of the Jewish nation. This is the son that Abraham loved. By the way, this is the first time the word love is ever used in the Bible. Abraham, this is the son that you love. Incidentally, the first time the word love is ever used in the New Testament is in the Gospel of Matthew when God the Father so told us, this is my beloved son whom I love and whom I am well pleased. Now, before I tell you the story about how Abraham responds, here's the question. How do you think you would respond? Your son, that grandson that's the apple of your eye. God says, I want you to offer him, I want you to offer her as a burnt offering sacrifice. How do you think you'd respond? Well, you know what? It all depends on how faithful you are. Because I want you to watch Abraham's response. Watch this. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Every time I read that story and I come to verse 3, it just, it, it's, mind, it's just mind-blowing to me. There's, there's no hesitation. There's no deliberation. There's no argumentation. There's no confrontation. It's just, I go where I need to go. Because the ultimate test of faithfulness is when you're willing to take the thing that is dearest to your heart, and you're willing to lay it at the feet of God, and you're willing to put it in the hands of God. So here's a test question. Remember, we're testing. Here's a test question. You ready? Which do you love more? And you fill in the blank. The blank God has given to you are the God who has given you the blank. Or you put any word in there you want to. Which do you love more? The children that God has given you or the God that's given you the children? The family that God has given you or the God that's given you the family? The success that God has given you or the God that's given you the success, the life that God has given you, or the God that has given you life, the job that God has given you, or the God that has given you the job. And once you answer that question, then you got to ask, am I willing to go where I need to go, even if I need to let that go? Faithfulness is when you go where you need to go. Faithfulness is when you give what you need to give. You go where you need to go, then you give what you need to give. Now, the next sentence paints a picture I want you to kind of chew over in your mind for just a moment. Watch this. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. Now, Abraham and Isaac are going up to a place called Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is not a particularly high mountain. It's only about 2,700 feet above sea level. But I don't think anybody outside of Jesus ever climbed a higher mountain than Abraham and Isaac did that day. Because let me remind you, today when we think about people being successful, here's what we think. They got a lot of money. They've got a big position. They got a lot of power. They've got a lot of influence. That's what we think about when it comes to success. In Abraham's day, success was measured in one word. Family, all wrapped up in family. Everything came down to family. Because the greatest hope a person would have 3,000 years ago to live a meaningful life and leave behind some kind of valuable legacy would be to become the father or become the mother, become the parent of descendants who would go on to become people of wealth and influence. Now God is saying to Abraham, Abraham, you've only got one chance to leave something behind that's worth leaving behind, and I want you to burn it up. I want you to sacrifice it. I want you to kill it. And you know, 
God even almost kind of rubs it in. I mean, Abraham, this is your only son. This is the son that you love. So now, Abraham, you got a dilemma. So what's it going to be, Abraham? Do you love the son that God gave you more than the God that gave you that son? I mean, am I really your one and only God, Abraham? Because Abraham, I want to tell you something, and by the way, he's telling us too. Anything you love more, anything you want more, anything you desire more, anything you crave more, anything you deserve more than God, that's your God. That's your idol. That's who you really worship. So this is a checkpoint of Abraham's faith in God and faithfulness to God. God's asking Abraham a hard question. Abraham, is your love for me greater than your love for that boy? Is your faith in me greater than your feelings for that boy? And folks, it's a question we all have to answer on a daily basis. Will I be faithful now to the God that's always faithful to me? Will I be faithful now to the God that's always faithful to me? See, this is the way our faith and God's faithfulness operates. And we don't like this, but I need to let you in a little secret. God will not reveal His faithfulness to us until we reveal our faith in Him. See, here's what we don't like. You know what God always says to us? You go first. God I can hardly pay my bills. It's hard for me to make ends meet. And I know what you promised. I know what you said in your word. I know you said, you know, hey, if you'll give me your tithe, I promise you, I'll bless you. You won't outgive me. And here's what we want to say. All right, God, I tell you what, let me win the good, good housekeeping sweepstakes, and I'll give. God says, you go first. God you give me a job that doubles my salary, I'll start giving. God says, you go first. You reveal your faith in me, then I will show my faithfulness to you. And by the way, here's what faith means. We all talk about having faith. We all talk about, oh yeah, I trust God, I believe in God. I want you to understand what the Bible says is faith. Because what we call faith is not faith, oftentimes. Faith means you go all in. Faith means it's all or nothing sellout. So I'm going to say something now some of you are not going to like. It's going to cause you to examine your own life. But I'm just being honest with you. This is where some of you are right now. You cannot be half faithful to God. You, 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 you can't be faithful part of the time to God. You can't be faithful to God only when it's not raining. Or you don't feel like it. Or it's inconvenient. Or it may cost you some money. I mean, I want you to imagine this. I mean, Teresa and I have been married 43 years, happily married, and love her more than I've ever loved her. I want you to imagine I came in the other day and I said, Teresa, I have some bad news and some good news. She said, what's the bad news? I said, well, honey, I haven't always been faithful to you. She said, well, what's the good news? And I said, well, I only messed up one day in the last month. How do you think that's going to work out for me? Right, hey, how about this one? Teresa, you won't believe this. You're going to be so proud of me. What do you mean? I met this woman the other day, beautiful, blonde. I mean, she was a knockout. She was just drop dead gorgeous. You'll be so proud of me. She says, why? I was almost faithful to you. How do you think that's going to work out for me? Let's be honest. That's exactly how we relate to God in our lives so often. If it doesn't cost me anything, if I don't have to get wet, if I don't have to get into a baptistry in front of a bunch of people I don't even know, I'll be faithful to you. Otherwise, count me out. You know what that woman wants of me right there? She wants me to be faithful in every way on every day that ends in Y. God desires and God demands and God deserves no less. 
God says, I want you to be faithful in every way, every day. And look, thank you, all to Jesus. Abraham comes through with flying colors. Watch this. Look, watch this. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Yes, my son Abraham replied, The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now Isaac's a smart boy. He'd been around the block, not his first rodeo. He's seen a lot of sacrifices, and he goes, uh, Dad, I know you got the wood, and I know you got the knife, but you forgot the lamb. Where's the lamb, Dad? <laughs> and you just got to love Abraham's answer. God will provide. See, Abraham is teaching Isaac one of the most valuable lessons. Mom and Dad, you will never teach your child a more valuable lesson than this lesson. Grandparents, you will never teach your grandkids a more valuable lesson. Listen, what's this? God's business is to keep his promises. Our business is to believe he will keep them and live like we believe it. Can I, can I be honest? Oh, yeah, go ahead and clap. Give the Lord a hand. That's good. Yeah. We're, we're going to be charismatic today. Listen. Let's be honest. Let's just call it like it is. And I'm in your group. I'm, not, I'm preaching to me. You're getting in the way. We don't always live like we believe God. I mean, let's just be honest. If we all live like we believe God, you know what I'm about to say. This church would have more money than we know what to do with if we really live like we believe God. If we really live like we believe God, wild horses couldn't keep you from telling other people about Jesus if we really believed God. If we really believed God, we'd take this book and say, I don't care what it says, I'm going to live it. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. And that's what, that, that, his business, I'll keep the promises. That's my business. Your business is live like a will. So here's what Abraham is doing. He's declaring his faith. He's expressing his faithfulness. And you know what else he's doing? He didn't even know he's doing this. He's actually prophesying about the future. Because this story is a perfect type and a picture of what happened nearly 2,000 years later. Because God would provide 2,000 years later a sacrificial lamb, except it would be his own son. And he would sacrifice his son so our sins could be forgiven. And see, here's the point. As I go through life and you go through life, God is going to test your faith and God will stretch your faith. But here's what you'll always know. I've learned this. If there's one thing I know about God, I've seen it happen in my life millions and millions of times, figuratively speaking, God always provides. Not some of the time. Not most of the time. God always always provides. He always has, and he always will. Now, here's what I want to see. This is the best part of the story. If you've ever been asked, and you will be, to give up your Isaac, you need to understand God will provide. Now, I realize that, that right now you're saying, boy, this has still been a, boy, it's a hard sermon, man. You're, you're saying, go where I need to go, and I don't always want to go there. I get it. Neither have I. And man, you want me to give what I, what I, what I need to give, and man, there's just sometimes it's hard to give. I get it. It's been hard for me. But this is what will motivate you, I hope, and will set you on fire to walk out these doors and say, Pastor, I'm going to go where God tells me to go, and I'm going to give what God tells me to give. Because here's how God operates. If you didn't like the first two parts of the message, you're going to love this part. When you go where you need to go, and when you give what you need to give, then you'll get what you need to get. Then you'll get what you need to get. Now, the story is coming to a breathtakingly climactic conclusion. All right, watch this. Watch, 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 watch what happens here. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He's going to do the deal. He's going to keep his end of the bargain. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied, do not lay a hand on that boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. 
So Abraham called that place, we say Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. Watch this. This is a voice. Talk about a climax. Abraham's about to do the unthinkable, the unbelievable. If you'd been standing off to the side, you'd have said, he's really going to do it. He's really going to do this. Hey, he's really going to, he's going to kill that boy. And God stops him. So, well, what is the point of the story? Okay, say it again. The whole story is a, it's a test, right? The whole story is a test. Now Abraham understood something. You ready? This is the point of the story. This is where you come into the story. God didn't want Isaac. God wanted Abraham. I'll, I'll take you. I don't ever do this, but I'm having such a good time. What is your name? My name's Chris. Chris. How you doing, Chris? Great. Hey, how are you, hon? You. you look like the cheapskate in the family. <laughs> Just a joke. Chris, look at me. God doesn't want your money. God wants Chris. I want your money. He doesn't need your money. You think God needs your money? He doesn't need, listen, God doesn't operate on blue light specials. God doesn't look for a divine discount. God says, I don't want your money. So next time you hear somebody say, well, I'll tell you what, the church just wants my money. I'm going to help you out. Look them in the eye and say, no, they want you. I want your money. I want Abraham. He didn't want Abraham's son. He wanted Abraham's surrender. He didn't want Abraham's family. He wanted Abraham's faith demonstrated in faithfulness. Listen, God knew what was in Abraham's heart. Well, then why did he do that? God wanted Abraham to know what was in his heart. So watch this, okay? God tested Abraham. Abraham passed the test. That's how you get a testimony. Now give me some love. I made that up. All right, now listen. God gave Abraham a test. Abraham passes the test. Abraham now has a testimony. So the next time you're going through a test... I met a man right out there. He knows who I'm talking to. He's in this service. Boy, is he in a test. I love this man, and I'm praying for him every Monday. He knows who I'm talking to. When God puts you in a test, God is giving you an opportunity to gain a testimony so you can give a testimony. You've never been through a test. You'll never have a testimony. That's what a testimony is all about. And did Abraham ever have a testimony? His testimony is more amazing because let me tell you this. There's a secret sauce to his faith. Because I know some of you are still wondering like I would the first time I read this story as a kid. How could a dad do that to his son? Man, I'm nine years old the first time I read this story. and understand. How in the world, Abraham, how could you do that? Well, I left out a part of the story on purpose. Because I want you to listen to what he said to the men who had come up with him before he took Isaac up to that mountain. Okay, listen to what he said. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then, what's that word? We will come back to you. Huh. It's kind of like you've heard the old joke about the Lone Ranger and, and, and Tonto, and they're surrounded by all these Indians. And the Lone Ranger says to Tonto, what are we going to do? And he says, what do you mean we, pale face? <laughs> we are going to come back. What do you mean we? Isaac's not coming. No, we are going to come back. What? Abraham is absolutely convinced, even though he's going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, they're going to come back together. Now, I promise you at this time, he didn't know how that was going to happen. He didn't really understand what he was being asked to do, but he trusted the one that was asking him to do it. 
He said, I don't understand this, God. I don't have to understand it. I believe you. Now, big question. Why did Abraham think that? Why did Abraham think? No, he didn't just think it. He said it because he believed it. Why did he believe and was convinced they were come back together? Well, the answer is found in a verse of Scripture that looks back over 2,000 years before that to what happened. Listen to this. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offering will be reckoned. And Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Here's what happened. Abraham's going up that mountain. He's got that knife. He's thinking it through, and he says, okay, God, you promised through Isaac, not through anybody else. You promised me that through that boy right there, I will have descendants come that will be greater than the number of the sands of the sea. Through my son, you're going to bring a Messiah. Through my son, you're going to absolutely bring the salvation of the world. You made a promise. That's point A. Point B, now you're asking me to sacrifice Isaac. But I know you're not going to break your promise. So Abraham's reasoning it out. I got it. You made a promise Isaac would be the guy. You've told me to sacrifice Isaac. There can only be one conclusion. You're going to raise that boy from the dead. You're going to bring my boy back to life. Only conclusion he could draw. Well, guess what? Once again, he's prophesying an event he didn't even know that would happen 2,000 years later. Because 2,000 years later, God would provide a sacrifice. It would be his own son, and you remember how Abraham caught the, the lamb? Where, where was the lamb caught? In a what? Yeah, thorns. What did they put on the head of Jesus? Crown of thorns. God takes the sacrifice. God puts the crown of thorns, but instead this time, God goes through with it. He sacrifices his own son. Bad news. He died. Oh, no, it's Good Friday, not Bad Friday. But he died for our sins. Yes, but God brought him back. From the dead. Just like Abraham believed 2,000 years earlier. That's why the proof of your faith in God is your faithfulness to God. Listen, if God never fails to do what He says He will do, we never have to hesitate to be faithful to do what He tells us to do. So you see, when you put all this in context, what a beautiful story. It's a preview of coming attractions. It's a picture of a God that loves us so much. He makes the ultimate sacrifice. He puts his one and only beloved son on the altar of sacrifice for us. said, oh, by the way, everybody believe here that Abraham loved Isaac. Everybody believe that? How much more did God love his beloved son than Abraham loved Isaac? Talking about love. But God put his son on the altar of sacrifice. You know why? He sacrificed Jesus for my sin so I wouldn't have to be sacrificed for my sin. And then three days later, to prove that he was who he said he was, God raised him from the dead. By the way, you know where Mount Moriah is? If you've been with me to Israel, you've walked on it, didn't even know it. You know where Mount Moriah is? That's where the Temple Mount is. That's where Jerusalem is. It's where Jesus was crucified. Same place at 2,000 years, 2, years before that Abraham took Isaac. Same exact place where, G, where God provided a Savior for the world. Now, we'll wrap this up. Watch God's final words. We're going to be finished. Watch this. God's final words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, I will surely bless you. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. God said, raises his hand. He said, Abraham, I'm telling you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me. Wait a minute. I am God. No higher oath could be given. No sure promise could be made because it's made by the God who always keeps his word, who never breaks a promise. Now, we're going to wrap this up. There's one thing we can all know from this story, and I don't want you to ever forget it. God will never give you a reason to distrust him even though your reason says you can't trust him. God will never give you a reason to distrust him even though your reason says you can't can't trust him. And because Abraham remained faithful, I go where I need to go. I give what I need to give. He got what he needed to get because he became not only the father of the Jews, 
He became the father of everyone who believes in the one who was sacrificed, Jesus. And because of his faithfulness, he became the father of a family that exceeds the sands of the sea. Now, here's the good news. Your faithfulness will never, exceeds God, will never exceed God's favor. You're, you, if you honor God with your faithfulness, God will honor you more. If you bless God with your faithfulness, God will bless you more. more. So, let me just tell you this, and then we're going to be done. When you, get up in the, when you get up in the morning to go to work, when you get up in the morning to go to school, when you slide your legs off the side of your bed and you sit up, just do this just for one day, just for tomorrow. Okay, everybody try to remember to do this. When you get up, before you get out of bed, I want you to say four words. This is a test. Because every day is a test. You never get a break from a test. Every day is a test. So, for example, will you be faithful to worship God privately and corporately? Will you be faithful to be in this building on Sundays when you can be here? Will you be faithful to serve God in His church and outside His church? Will you go where you're needed to go? Give what you need to give. Helping with children, helping with preschoolers, helping with teenagers, helping park cars, helping serve. Will you serve? Will you be faithful? Will you be faithful to do what Jesus did for three years of his life? Be in a small group. Be discipled. Be in a group where you need to encourage others and you need to be encouraged. Will you be faithful to be sent? Whether it's to your neighbor across the street or to a country around the world. Will you be faithful to be sent wherever God wants you to go to share the gospel that can change anybody's life? So, as we wrap up this series about mirror image, isn't it kind of amazing that we land on this one little trait called faithfulness? When you think about, of all the things that Jesus said he wants to say to all of us when we meet him the first time, he only says one thing he wants to say to all of us, right? It's not hello. Welcome to my house. Good to see you. Where you been? It's well done, good, and faithful servant. So the question is, every day, in every way, the rest of your life, will you get up and look at him and say, God, I don't have all the ability in the world, but I've got reliability. You can count on me. We are so glad you tuned in here on the Touching Lives digital channel, and we hope you enjoyed the sermon today. Be sure to click and follow this page and feel free to leave any comments below. We would love to hear your thoughts from today's message. Look for a new episode to be posted on this channel each Sunday. And in the meantime, feel free to call us at 800-413-1131 or email us at info at touchinglives.org with prayer needs or questions. Thank you so much for watching today. I'll see you right here next time for another episode of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Touching Lives teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This program is sponsored by Touching Lives Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.